my little brother, Lauren, a.k.a. Lil Lauren, a.k.a. LJ. I don't know why his mother and, and my mother decided that it'd be a good idea to name both of us after our father, but we, have, we share the same father, and he was born in 1998. Guys, oh my goodness, that just hurts my heart. So he will be 22 this year, and he has a dream of being this this music producer, he want to rap. And last year when he told me that, I said, how does that differentiate between all you and your boys that you want to rap? But this year, I actually talked to him last night, and he shared his plan with me. And I'm not going to share the plan because I don't want y'all to go out there and try to do it. But I was surprisingly uh, excited and, and shocked. Like, okay, this young man has a plan. I don't know what will happen, but I'm proud of him because sometimes he exaggerates. But then, oh, my brother Jarrell. So Jarrell and I, um, we haven't spoken to each other in a while, but every time we, we come together, like it's always big sis this, little brother that. And so we're a year apart. His mother and my father were together when we were teenagers. And so we got in a lot of trouble in Germany and in Colorado together. And, and uh, I'm, I'm really fond of those moments. But he would always get caught because his stories were never believable, right? So a story that every time we talk to each other or every time we see each other he brings up is that one time out of thousands of times he beat me at basketball. So I know y'all are probably tired of basketball stories, but just, just follow me here. So he tells this story. He's like, oh, you remember that one time I beat you at basketball? He starts off there. Like, remember that one time I beat you at basketball? Like, we were both huffing and puffing, and it was down to the last wire, and I shot the ball in your face. So now he doesn't just tell this to me, he tells this to everybody, right? Now what's interesting about the story is, A, because sometimes he does stretch the truth, nobody believes it. A, I mean, he wasn't a basketball player. He played football when we were in middle school. And so the fact that somebody who did play basketball beat somebody that consistently played basketball didn't seem realistic. But I gotta tell y'all, my brother did beat me that one time in basketball but it wasn't exactly how he expressed it, right? So I did play tough defense because I laid off him in the beginning. He did shoot a jump shot in my face, but it wasn't what y'all are probably thinking. It wasn't an MJ slow motion shot. He literally picked up his dribble, couldn't dribble anymore, looked around and just threw the ball in and it went in. And he ran across, we were outside a little concrete. He ran across the concrete like he won a championship game. And that really, that really bothered me because, again, every time I see him, he tells that story. He tells that story to everyone else. But it was to draw a point. Like, Lauren thought she was big and bad and that she'd come back and I actually beat her, right? Um, again, I don't play basketball anymore, but it was, it was a point that after that moment, he never, he never beat me at basketball again. So we're going to look at somebody who is probably the greatest illustrator, the greatest storyteller that this world has ever seen. And that's Jesus Christ. So he gets ready as we're, I shared last week that we're gonna start this sermon series on the gift of grace. And so he paints this beautiful, this bold, and it's almost unbelievable picture of the gift of grace in Luke 15. So if you all would please join with me, stand, scroll your, your iPads or your phone to Luke chapter 15, verses 20 to 24. And if you don't have a Bible or the phone, guess what? We put it on the screen for y'all today. <laughs> so I am reading from the uh, ESV version. And this is probably a familiar passage if you've ever visited a church. Um, but no matter how many times we read a passage of scripture, um, it's my belief that God's word is active and living and he can always reveal something new to us, okay? All right. And I'll start. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him 
and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and he is alive again. He was a lost and he is now found. And they began to celebrate. May the hearer and the doers of God's word say amen. Please have your seat. All right, like any sermon, we're going to start off talking about some context. Yep, you can just take it off because I don't want everybody to look it up there. Thank you. All right, so this story begins uh, Luke 15, 1 through 2. You, you have the, the word of God says, Now all tax collectors and sinners were coming near him, him is Jesus, and listening to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and, eat with, and eats with them. Jesus, as he was known to do many times before, is receiving more sinners to himself, and there he's found eating with them. And this was not the only time that Jesus has ever done that or placed himself with sinners. Remember when he went to Matthew's house, he actually went inside of a sinner's house, a tax collector's house, and he ate with other tax collectors. Remember the time when, when he spoke to the woman who had too many boyfriends, right? Um, but she began to profess the gospel and telling people, hey, there's a man that told me everything about my life. He was also the same man that spoke to a woman that was caught in adultery, as we said a few weeks ago. Like, Jesus was known to be with people who were, who were outcast. Now, people didn't They weren't surprised, like they could not deny that Jesus was a special fella. Actually, Mark 1, 2, 2, 22 says, people were amazed or astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes or the teachers of the law. But here in this text, the religious elite are grumbling because for their standards, Jesus is just being too friendly with godless people. Jesus would just, he wasn't going where the old church folk would go. So in response to their grumbling, we see Jesus give three parables. Now the first kind of have identical meanings, right? The the lost sheep and the lost coin um, both kind of teach the same principle. Namely that when a person loses something that's valuable to them, they'll rejoice when they find it. And what I find interesting is in both of those parables, it's not the fault of the sheep or the coin, right? Uh, The sheep wanders aimlessly, unintentionally, and the coin is lost by its owner. But it says when that shepherd and when that woman finds what they view as precious, that they go to their neighbors and they go to their friends and rejoice. That's what verse 6 and verse uh, 9 says, rejoice. Now, It's one thing to feel relieved when you find your car keys. It's another thing to feel relieved when you find your shades. I wanted to wear my shades today and just stun a little bit, right? But to throw a party? I think what, well not I think, I know Jesus was showing the value of these things there, right? So they they go and get people to celebrate, to throw a party because this thing was extremely valuable. And the application is simple for both of them. I tell you that in the same way, this is in uh, chapter uh, 15, verse 7, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous person who needs no repentance. Now, if the Pharisees could not pick up what Jesus was putting down in these first two parables, this third one makes it crystal clear. Has there ever been a time in your life where you felt like you deserved something really bad? Like you worked your butt off for it. Staff sergeants, you always volunteering. You're being innovative. You're studying your butt off for tech, but you didn't get the promote statement you wanted. Officers, you've worked your butt off. You're volunteering. You're leading troops, and you want this special exec or this staff position but you weren't recommended for that job. Ladies, you had a long day at work. Maybe not in this context, but just think about back home. You had a long day at work and you're frustrated and you just want to vent. You don't want anybody to fix your problems, but your loved one 
is watching the football game. Gentlemen, you are treating a young lady special, treating her right, being the friend that she says she needs, but she eventually puts you in the friend zone. See, all of this is frustrating to a sense. You, you believe that you deserve something, you worked hard for it, but you don't get it. Now, on the contrary, that's not what's happening in this parable. <laughs> Jesus begins talking about a father who has two sons, and his youngest son goes on to ask him for something that he truly doesn't deserve. He says, give me the share of the property that is coming to me, and this give me isn't a request. This give me is an actually emph uh, emphatic demand. The son is demanding this father's inheritance that he didn't deserve now, so he can do whatever he wants. I'd say that demand is pretty laughable today. Even in my 30s, if I demand my parents to do anything, they'd probably just tell me some choice words. Get out of their face. I don't have an inheritance for you. You better go work and get it your own way. <laughs> But in that day, it was more than laugh laughable. It was disrespectful, extremely disrespectful. Not just to place a, a demand on the head of the house, but to demand his inheritance. According to that culture, this kind of request is a major insult to the father. You are not supposed to expect or receive any type of inheritance before the death of your father. So to ask his dad for a share of his property is just basically saying, Sir, just drop dead. Give me what you owe me. According to that culture, this is a spit. According to that culture, too, the father should not have given the property to his son. But this father did. Because if he didn't, and the son continued to insist, then it would be the son's fault. But since he gave it to his son willingly, the father, in this case, was willing to take on the blame. See this point here. The story does not say that the father ever tried to deny the request, but he willingly gave his inheritance to his son. Thus, he's covering up this insult, this sin, and he's letting himself become an insult. I want this community to think that I broke the rule rather than my son breaking the rule. This is going to make sense a little later, but this is just another example of God's exa uh, exaggerant grace towards us. Now later on, we see that this son is probably gonna do what most young adults do if they got their money. He lost his entire mind. Remember, this was a king's son, and so he was loaded. He went to another country and squandered all of his money. I think that uh, if we looked, you can imagine, I mean, I don't know if people watch trash TV here. I don't, I just want to put it out here. But like reality TV, right? Like the real housewives of Hollywood. Like if, if they had a TV show back then, it'd probably be like the real rich kids of Galilee. He was probably going to be the main event because of how he squandered his money. And let's be clear, the scripture says that even in this severe famine, like he began to starve. He had nothing left. Now, we don't know if it's weeks, we don't know if it's months, we don't know if it's years. I'm thinking it's years if he had so much money, but it, we do know that it got extremely bad for him. He once lived this lavish lifestyle of a prince, but now he was currently lonely, broke, and now has to work for a, a, a citizens of a foreign country. Now, I'm reminding y'all, this is just... This is a story. This is not really what, hap what is happening. Jesus is talking to really self-righteous religious leaders at this point. And these religious leaders were extremely prideful. So to work for another country um, was, was beneath them. That's why they looked down upon tax collectors who were working for the Roman citizens, or the Roman gov government, excuse me. But that's not bad enough, guys. I'm just I'm going through to paint this picture so y'all can really see God's grace. That's not bad enough, guys. So he decides that he needs money, and he goes, and he works, and takes care of pigs. 
Now, swine was considered to be the filthiest of all of the animals of that day. Leviticus 11.27 forbid Moses and all of his followers from ever eating the pig. Deuteronomy 14.8 reinforces that by saying, this is unclean for you. You shall now eat this as food or touch its carcasses. But not only is he feeding the pigs, he is almost about to eat the exact same thing that the pigs are getting ready to eat. He was just that desperate. But then verse 17 through 19, he has this realization. The word of the Lord said he comes to himself. And when he was in his right mind, when he realized that the position that he was in was actually a choice, when he remembered who his daddy was, an actual king. See, this wasn't a bragging moment. This wasn't a proud moment. It was a humbling, sorrowful uh, experience. So he began to rehearse this apology that he had in his head. And this kind of self-talk. Verse 17 says, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He's not trying to be back in the same position. He's coming from a humbling approach, and this is where we get to our text. That first line said, and he rose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, ran, and embraced, and kissed him. G.S. family, the first point is the gift, of God, the gift of God's grace is active. It says while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. The father was actively looking, actively waiting, I say even actively expecting his son to return home. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any of you should perish, but all should reach repentance. See, God is not bound by our time. Other people may have gone on with their life. But this father is actively waiting for his child to return. This son betrayed his father. And instead of having a heart and heart, he is waiting day and night for him to return home. Now, we all know that this father represents God in this parable. So God is waiting day and night, looking from afar for us to return home to him. It is an active type of grace. And then it goes on to say that he felt compassion, ran, embraced, and kissed him. Ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest or submit to you that God's grace is affectionate and unexpected. See, this son squandered everything, and he's returning with no shoes. He's feeling, he's running, he's walking slowly, excuse me probably feeling unworthy, dirty, and he was just in a pigsty, so smelly as well. Yet this king feels compassion towards him. Now this word compassion in the Greek is painting a picture of having this movement in your bowels. And why does that matter? Because we see heart and we see emotions at the seat of the heart. But in that context, being able to feel something in your gut meant something. And so when Jesus feels this gut, heart-wrenching gut feeling when he sees the multitude hungry, and when he sees the, the two blind men, he's equating it to the same feeling that the father sees when he sees his son returning home. Now, what I saw was that this, this description of the word compassion has, was only in uh, the Gospels, and it was only when it was describing Jesus's compassion. So, he doesn't explicitly say this, but him comparing 
or using this parable to use the same word as the Bible talks about his compassion to people, he's comparing himself with God the Father, making a case that he and, and God is one. Now, why did I say God's grace is unexpected? Well, this author, Kenneth Bailey, he authored the book In the Christ and the Prodigal, and he explains that if a Jewish son lost his inheritance amongst Gentiles and returned home to the community, they would perform a ceremony that would include breaking a large pot in front of him, yelling, you are now cut off from your people. And this community then would reject him. So in Jesus' parable, this king, of this father, he's doing something unexpectable. Matter of fact, quite unbelievable to the context that he's sharing this parable with. Seeing a man run, let alone this, this king, he is leaving before the villagers, before the community could get that pot and see this man returning home. Before the community could humiliate him, God meets him in an unexpected way, or the father meets him in an unexpected way. So imagine a king running. That's already looked down upon. Running for the man in that context is seemingly undignified. Because when they ran, they had to lift up their tunics and show their bare legs. And just in that context, that was shameable. But we see that this father, this king, is okay with putting himself and being a laughing stock to meet his son. So Jesus is making this bold statement about the gift of Christ. When he kisses his son, when he, when he holds on to the son, what he is saying is this is a sign of reconciliation. Now, even though he disrespected me, even though he doesn't deserve it, I'm going to initiate this reconciliation. Thus, again, I submit that God's grace, the gift of grace, is affectionate and is unexpected. So later on, the, the, the word of the Lord said, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So we see here that the gift of grace makes one apologetic and repentant. The son was already rehearsing what he was going to say, right? But I imagine he's probably hesitant. How will my dad take this? Will he break the pot in front of him? In front of him? But instead, he's met with a loving father. 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he loved us first. So since this son is experiencing the father's love, I imagine he felt safe enough to apologize. He didn't expect his father to be petty and hold it over his head because he was already experiencing God's love or his father's love in that moment. His father still loved him. His father most likely had already forgiven him when he gave him um, his inheritance. But see, if he hadn't come to his senses, if he hadn't left that pig pen, if he hadn't realized who he belonged to and he wasn't supposed to be there, there would have been no way he could have personally experience his father's grace in returning home. See, repent, repentance requires a level of brokenness, and this man was broken. The motives of repentance are chiefly found in the goodness of God and his divine love, not us feeling sorry for ourselves. So I just believe that it might have been a little easier for him to repent, to admit that he was wrong, and knew that he needed to be made whole because he felt God's divine love. And the last point of today, the gift of God's grace is amazing. Verse 22 reads, but the father said to his servant, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this, 
my son was dead and is now alive. He was lost and now found. And they began to celebrate. See, the father doesn't even allow his son to continue to apologize. He doesn't allow him to finish with his eloquent speech. Matter of fact, he says, bring this robe quickly and place it on him. This man, and I've said this before, this man did not have time to make himself clean. This man did not have time to go take on a shower, take a shower. This man did not need to go put on his old attire. His father says, I will send my servants to assist you and remove those filthy garments. I imagine if I was a Pharisee, it, it sounds kind of like Zechariah 3, 4 through 6. It says, now when Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments, the angel said to those standing before him, remove those filthy garments from him. And him he said, behold, I have taken away your iniquity, taken it away from you, and I've clothed you with pure vestments. See, this father was removing outer filth, but the parable was representing the fact that Jesus, the fact that God was cleansing him. That God could take away this guy's iniquities. And so the son doesn't have to repeat what he did while he was out there in the world or in this foreign country. All he has to do is surrender and allow his daddy to clean him up. And not only does his daddy clean him up, his daddy says, you know what? I need to remind you of the position you are in. So I'm gonna give you this family's ring and I'm going to put shoes on your feet. And this shoes is significant because remember, the son just wanted to be a hired hand. But his daddy said, no, you're not a slave. You're not a servant. You are a king's son. So go put some shoes on my boy. Give him back this ring that, that he could have squandered, but I still got it from him. That's the grace. Sometimes, you know, I remember... Uh, back in the day, my grandma used to say, sometimes God doesn't give you uh, everything that you ask for because you just can't handle it at that moment. So maybe the father, remember, he's expecting his son to return. Realize, I'll give him all of his inheritance, but I'll keep this ring for him because he's coming back. And I need to remind him that he belongs to me, that he is my son. Has God ever used another human being to minister to you and remind you who you belong to. I hear the Lord saying that maybe you hadn't been in church in a while. Maybe the only time you pray is when you're about to eat some food. Maybe you feel like God doesn't listen to your prayers, that he's not concerned for you. But that's not the case. This passage reminds us that we have always been and will always be God's child. And you may have a hard time feeling that way, but God's grace is so amazing that you didn't have to earn that robe, you didn't have to work and pay off that ring, and you didn't have to buy your own shoes because it already belongs to you. How many of us sometimes forget because of our current situation that we belong to the person who created this being that created this entire universe? The gift of God is active. The gift of God is affectionate and unexpected. The gift of God makes one apologetic and repentful when you're in his presence. And it's simply amazing. I was lost, but now found. I was blind, and now I see. That's the gift of God's grace. 
I'm going to ask for you all to bow your heads. Now, I know we all have been like the prodigal son in one phase of his life. Some of us actively walked away from the Lord. Church hurt. Bad things happen to, to good people. Other, was, other of us have felt unworthy. Like I've done too much for him to ever forgive me. Some of us are just seekers and, and we don't know which way to go and which way to believe. But the word of the Lord says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so as I've done before, I'm going to ask if there's anyone in here who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, to just place your finger in the air if you would like to get to know him. It seems like we're all brothers and sisters in faith. God's grace for us is unearned. It is unmerited, but it is ours. And so sometimes we just have to be reminded that it didn't cost us anything, but it cost Jesus Christ his life. He was the perfect sacrificial lamb. A man who knew no sin. And the Bible said it pleased God to bruise him. This wasn't child abuse, but this was because God had every single one of us in his mind. Now, if you're tired of running, if you're tired of sleeping near pigs, if you're tired of choosing to stay away from the Father because you feel like you're too dirty, I want you to know that God is knocking at your heart and you are not far from him. So I'm going to say a prayer for us with our the eyes closed. Dear Heavenly Father, first of all, we thank you for another day to hear your word. We thank you for another day to be around people who could potentially help us uh, remain accountable and faithful to you. We're so thankful that you never gave up on us. That even while we were faithless, you remained faithful towards us, Lord. But we celebrate that not only that Jesus died, but he, ro he rose and he's living again, interceding for us when we can't even pray for ourselves. God, we love you. And we thank you for this gift of grace that you have given us and will continue to give us as we live. So God, be with your children today. Protect them as they exit this church building, but they never leave your presence. I pray that they're reminded that God, everything that they go to, they go through, can work together for their good because they love you. That even though the cross will get heavy, Lord, that you're walking right beside them. And that we all make the declaration that we'll give ourselves away to you, God, so that you can have your way in our life. Ultimately, it's to lift you up so that you can draw all men to you, Lord. We ask and we pray these things in your most precious holy name. And the church said, amen. So I got to ask, all hearts, all minds clear. I love you all. All right, let's stand and I'll dismiss you all, give the benediction. And please do not forget to potentially sign up for this fellowship. I already got people in my mind bringing what? 
what they need to bring. This will be a good, good bang for Mr. Robert. I'm going to just put it out there. <laughs> All right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you make his face shine upon you and be gracious towards you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And the church said, amen. Oh, the worship. No, y'all can still go. I can talk. The worship.